Okay. Um, I think we should start. Can I welcome you to two weeks of this symposium on architectural education? Um, it, it sort of might need some preliminary explanation as to why in the end we decided that it should be a two-week event. Um, some people had suggested that, for example, we might be able to get away with a kind of day or two-day conference. But there's a kind of ineluctable logic uh, of conferences, which means they're pretty much a waste of time, which is in order to get students to come to them, they have to be kind of packed with kind of well-known architectural celebrities uh, who then aren't given enough time to develop any argument at all. Uh, so basically, it's just a time to kind of see them. Uh, words like any kind of come to mind. Um, we decided in the end that the only kind of serious way of doing it was actually over quite a long period and to steal away from you uh, all the time of kind of lunch times and in the evenings to hold events. Uh, now events to what end? Um, I think the school community was perfectly clear in its mind when it kind of uh, asked us to do this. When I say us, I mean myself and bubble kind of Belinda Flaherty uh, and Mickey Hawks, without whom this would not be kind of happening. To try to kind of organize it in order to, how do you put it, either to kind of raise the intellectual kind of level of discussions uh, which inevitably concern the AA's kind of move towards to select a chair, but also in, I think, a certain kind of institutional recognition uh, that we cannot just go on at the AA um, electing people, ruining their life, complaining about them, and starting all over again. And at this time round, we really needed to think seriously, not just about who we wanted, but who we were to be in order that we might, through the search committee, move towards a selection uh, of a candidate. And partly, this, these events are not just about the attempts to delineate the anonymous profile of a chair, but to begin to entertain a number of models of who we might be uh, that such a job is interesting, desirable, and above all possible uh, for someone to do, either as themselves or in some innovative combination of the functions. Having said that, this fortnight is very definitely for the school. And I need to say that very clearly because other people have been somewhat critical uh, that we have not invited initially the whole membership and we have not invited um, people outside. Now, if there's one thing you cannot accuse the AA of, it's lack of generosity. We open our doors and our arms to all sorts of people and schools and whatever over most of the time. But this is one of those few times that we need to reserve to ourselves and to try to think out uh, a model of who we are, uh, a model of the chair, and where we think architectural education is and where we think it's going. It's to this end that we've planned both the lunchtime events and the evening events. Now, if I draw a distinction between those, it's because largely in the evenings, We've invited people who, in one way or another, 
have, I think, something to say to us about architectural education through their own experience. Of course, it's always very difficult. It wouldn't be too difficult to find people to do that, but persuading architects to come and do it uh, is actually extremely difficult. Um, I was reminded, you know, as we tried to plan it, um, of the cautionary tale when once I very naively organized a conference in the 97 uh, on architecture uh, and pr the presumably coming Labour government. What demands uh, might be put on the Labour government by architects? And you expected architects who'd been invited to come and make, you know, some serious kind of suggestions. After all, there are quite a few you might make uh, about what the Labour government might do. Um, I myself was a little surprised. I recall, I'm trying to think, oh, it was Tony Fretton uh, who turned up and thought that yet again um, the world <laughs> would profit from being shown slides of the Lisson Gallery uh, as if it was an answer to the question, what should the Labour government do about architecture? Um, so, Belinda and I have somehow, as politely as possible, uh, tried to persuade architects. We've made kind of jokes like, we're not showing slides. Um, I'm not sure whether this has finally gotten through to all the architects, but. Uh, it will be interesting uh, to see. I mean, the problem of architects is that you invited them, if you invited them to come and speak at your funeral, they'd end up saying, you know, I thought I'd show a few recent projects. <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're quite difficult to bend into the service of altruistic thought. Uh, anyway, you will see because I hope that everyone uh, has uh, a copy of the full kind of syllabus of events. And you have to realize also that the success or indeed failure of this fortnight uh, really depends in our minds entirely on the student body. We've asked speakers to keep to a kind of brief uh, account so that there is more than enough time for people to ask questions from the floor. And if we don't have questions and points of view expressed from the floor, this enterprise is almost, as far as I'm concerned, kind of vitiated. When you do speak, I think it's kind of quite valuable. It's not something we normally ask at the AA, but I think it's helpful in order that the whole fortnight is a way in which the school also gets to know itself, uh, that perhaps you could kind of state who you are uh, and what part of the school you come from. Um, because I think, you know, that is an important aspect. We have then said that each evening, um, after the event, we will sort of migrate upstairs to the bar so that speakers have an informal opportunity, or rather students, the school community has a, an informal opportunity of pursuing questions and points of view, whatever. And I think often it's the case <coughs> that speakers, especially from the States, will be coming maybe for two or three days, and that it's perfectly possible for units or groups of students, or indeed individual students, to ask to meet and to pursue the questions <coughs> I think you'll find that one thing that unites a disparate number of speakers is that they, are, they understand and are prepared to put the energy into helping you come to think seriously about the issues which you both have to debate and to resolve this year. I'm sorry to go on so long by way of introduction, uh, but now we should introduce this evening's first speaker. I'm extremely pleased that Paul Finch has agreed to give the opening talk. Paul has always been <coughs> both an amazing 
force for architecture in London, and at the same time also not only by virtue of being frequently a member of council, uh, but in his own kind of way, of being a friend to the AA. It, it's always, to my mind, kind of terribly kind of surprising <laughs> that someone so practical could keep in their heart an affection for us. Um, Paul, although not an architect, <coughs> was originally kind of came into architecture by being, first of all, the news editor of building design. Um, and for some time, he was editor for a long time, from 83 to about, I think, 94, was editor of building design, and then editor of the Architects' Journal. Since then, he's kind of moved ever onwards and upwards uh, into being a CABE commissioner since 1999, uh, <coughs> and of which he is the currently acting chair. Um, he's the joint editor of Planning in London and an AA council member from 1992 to 1997. Um, I think probably the only thing one might question about Paul is uh, the fact that he was also awarded by the Blair government the OBE. <laughs> I'd like you to to welcome Paul Finch. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for that. I can't tell you how um, actually rather frightening this is, speaking to you uh, as an amateur in an audience made up of real professionals who really do architectural education or who are real architects who do architecture or, or allied activities. Uh, or students of, of this institution. And I was reminded the only, the only thing one can say as an amateur when confronted by an audience of professionals um, is that it was an amateur who designed the Ark, but professionals who designed the Titanic, not that we want to extend that particular uh, parallel too far. Um, actually, the parallel I'd like to uh, use this evening and since I'm not an architect, I am going to show some slides, but I promise that it'll be kind of rapid fire, and then we'll move on to some uh, bullet point questions, propositions, call them what you will. The AA, uh, it seems to me, is in the position, on the one hand, of uh, being a lively creature which has decided to examine itself. Um, it's kind of thinking about whether it needs a vet, not because it's sick, but because it wants a once-over. Uh, just to find out maybe there is something wrong. I mean, who knows? But on the other hand, uh, there are always uh, people or, or forces or institutions that say, actually, why are you doing this? What's wrong with things? Um, leave aside the recent, what should we call it, uh, minor unpleasantness, as they used to say about the American Civil War. I mean, why can't we just carry on as we are? What's all this change stuff? Uh, and this is like the, uh, the two very competitive brothers from Boston, the Smith brothers, one of whom became a vet and was a very successful vet, and the other of whom became a taxidermist and was equally successful. And these competitive brothers decided when they were in their 40s that despite the fact they were highly competitive and they both loved their mother and they both wanted to do really well, that nevertheless there might be something to be said to increase their business margins uh, to save on overheads if they combined their activities and combined their businesses. And uh, they formed a new business which was called Smith & Smith, Vet and Taxidermist. And their motto was, whatever happens, you get your pet back. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, of course, in architectural education, by and large, you do get a qualification. I mean, that's what mostly happens. Uh, it could be at this school, which has a unit system and students from all over the world. There is nothing special about that anymore. There are lots of schools in this town, let alone this country, that has unit systems and students from all over the world. And we'll come on to that um, a little bit later. Uh, but the question, the fundamental underlying question is, uh, is the AA going to be more of the same 
less of the same, more of something different, a little bit more of something different, where does it stand? Where is its ground? Where does it sit in relation to what it might think of as competitors, uh, both here uh, and overseas? And how does it stand in relation to uh, the world in which its products, if I could use that rather crude term, uh, are going to engage and become involved? And what I want to do is to just show a few slides which are about new into old, and to some extent how, as Cedric Price used to say, how quickly in Britain, how quickly uh, something can become traditional. In no time, if it happens twice, it's a tradition. Uh, for example, like electing AA chairman. You know. Actually, you did it once and it became a tradition uh, back in the early 1970s. Uh, we need to keep that background that uh, we are, whatever the AA is, actually we are in Britain and that does have an influence and it does make us part of a certain attitude, I think, towards the past. So let's dim the lights and uh, just look at a few things. And I want to start with that because I am a Londoner and, um, you know, can you teach, teach an old dog new tricks? Is that what architecture schools are all about? And what is the architect? What is that education all about? The cartoonist Louis Hellman, the famous cartoon, the architect as seen by. And of course the most significant one, bottom right, the architect, whatever else anyone in society thinks, pointing the way forwards and the spirit, disinterested uh, sainthood, you might say, uh, towards a better uh, and brighter future. And I think in relation to architectural education, by the way, um, that certainly the question of how the architect is seen by the quantity surveyor, that is to say a spendthrift who knows nothing uh, about cost, uh, and by the builder as an aesthete uninterested in the messy building, uh, business of construction process, um, rings a few unfortunate bells. OK, and by contrast, here's the taxidermist version of what it's all about, the conservation officer. But of course, to some extent, you can only engage with history, you can only argue with it, if you know what it is. And talking about uh, old into new, here we are. This stuff is all 40 years old now. Um, for, the, for the younger members of the audience, the thing on the top right isn't a strange icon. That's what used to be two shillings. Um, shillings invented by the Romans, but dumped by Britain relatively recently. Uh, another innovation. Uh, and at the time you thought, well, you know, this is kind of comic stuff. Um, it's never going to happen. My God, how could you have a city that walked about? Silly architects, aren't they crazy? Uh, and then along, uh, 40 years later, along comes this kind of thing. And it's a blobby thing, but it is in a city. Uh, and it is, as you know, Cook and Fournier. Uh, and it is saying that you can put something new into something old. And you think, well, this is architecture, denying its context. Well, not at all, because Gratz periodically commissions architects to do buildings which are quite unlike their existing surroundings. This is perhaps the most extreme example they've done so far. This is not context-free, and it is, in fact, part of a tradition, something than standalone uh, and new. Uh, ditto, you say, Frank Gehry, well, uh, what an amazing thing, and you think, well, Bill Bow, um, leave aside the question of how architecture is representation of a culture can say something in this case about how the Basques can do whatever they want within the context of, uh, of, of a wider Spain. But any, even at the level of, of icon and representation, this is part of a tradition. Um, Gaudi, the only architect thus far who really has uh, been made a saint, um, and in some ways doing things which were not so different to what Gary was doing, or has been doing, um, this building here, the dullest Art Deco building in the world, um, Bankside Power Station, a one-finger salute from the new socialist government in the late 1940s in this country, looking across the Thames <coughs> to St Paul's Cathedral. And was there a row about that at the time? Uh, but now, of course, uh, 60 years on, uh, 
it's such an important London icon that you wouldn't dare deem a dream of trying to demolish uh, that tower unless you were David Chipperfield, whose competition entry was therefore unsuccessful because he was the only one who said, that tower does nothing, let's have it down, and theref thereby sealed his fate. And conservative organisations in London, possibly the most conservative, the Maribyrn Cricket Club, they don't even let women into the sort of main uh, clubhouse thing. Yet when it comes to doing architecture, what do they do? They commission uh, two architects um, with, uh, with, with AA credentials, uh, one of whom a woman knows nothing about cricket whatsoever. Um, in that respect, it's like quite a lot of men. And the other one, a Czech emigre, who'd never even seen cricket till 1968, and in fact, who wondered why, since his media centre was the, at that end of the ground, why they had to change ends when they were playing. Couldn't they just <laughs> bowl from one end because it would be more convenient for the journalists in that media centre? But of course, an almost instant international uh, icon, and by the same people, um, the Paco Rabanne dress, uh, the 1960s, it's very, very interesting to me. So much stuff out of the 1960s is being built out now. And the idea that new things are always things that are dreamt up yesterday as opposed to yesteryear or yesterdecade um, is quite curious. This is Selfridge's Birmingham, of course. Um, and quite unlike some of the criticism of this building, um, far from being context-free and ignoring its context, I think it's the only building as part of this shopping centre uh, which makes any sort of relationship to the church and in the process transforms the middle of that previously absolutely gruesome, gruesome uh, town centre. Um, and if we're, since we're into the world of blobs, um, here's another one. Um, it's great, it happens, is it a problem? I don't think so. And this is all very familiar stuff from the AA, I suppose, in, essentially in the 1960s, all that biological computer stuff, which couldn't be built out at that time, but it could certainly be thought and speculated about. And a slightly different thing, colloquially known as Madonna's bra, I show this because <laughs> the relationship of architecture to the public this building was going to be uh, recommended for refusal by the planners and an irate, an irate town, count, uh, town meeting at Ilfracombe had hundreds of local people who demanded that this be given planning permission because they wanted something new and fresh and different. It's made of brick, by the way. Uh, and then later, um, well, these, these ideas <coughs> represented here, the Foreign Office Architects uh, Yokohama Fort Terminal, and this is more recent vintage, but I would guess that the ideas that were informing this sort of architecture uh, were probably being discussed uh, here in the kind of, you know, in the maelstrom of kind of AA teaching 10 years ago, 12 years. I mean, it was, it was a fair time ago, and relatively speaking, this has come into production fast. Um, but, of course, you haven't seen this building in Britain. Um, you, you, you see it somewhere else, um, a, a kind of tribute to the power of international competitions. Um, and this building, of course, too, uh, has its own particular uh, context and shows that megastructures, of course, don't have to be vertical. Uh, but sometimes they are. Uh, Norman Foster's Gherkin, which I was amazed to see described on television as it has curved forms, it was described as a feminine building. Well, I must say, looking at that, um, feminine <laughs> wasn't entirely the first word that came to my mind. Um, though, you know, curves are fab. And here's, here's the context. So what is the context? In this case, uh, the context is a certain skyline in a certain very, very uh, commercial city. Um, but the things we have to pay attention to now, actually, you can forget the skyline context. It's all about the ground plane um, and how you cut that building back and make a little bit of concrete space. But of course, it isn't really. It's all about the skyline and it's all about bespoke office buildings. But this is interesting, this new into old thing. This building was supported by English heritage and it involved knocking down um, a listed building and it was a very significant moment um, in the planning history of the city of London. I'm not sure that it would happen today. And on the other side of the river, the great Renzo Piano spire, and I show this because I think that the um, 
there's just <coughs> one such a neat trick here which relates new and old in an entirely satisfactory way. And it's not like any of the normal architectural orthodoxies that I'm going to come on to later, because here's a building that's a thousand foot tall. Hey, that's big, isn't it? No, it isn't. It's the same so height as the Eiffel Tower, um, 1900. Um, yes, it's pretty big for London. Tallest building in London, Canary Wharf Tower, 850 feet. This one's 150 feet higher. Now, Piano says, I wanted to relate this to London's history. I wanted to relate it to the church spires, which when originally built, the medieval church spires were stone and therefore white, so his glass has to be white, which technically he can do, and he wants to relate it to spires on the, uh, the, the sailing boats of the nearby uh, Thames. But he's got a problem because his last 150 feet cannot accommodate any offices or apartments or penthouses or anything at all. So, you know, this is very, very expensive. So what does he do? He puts his radiator in the top, which takes all the excess heat up through the building, has opening vents and at 1,000 feet, it's 24 knots per hour, the wind takes the heat out of the building. And that elegant combination of an attitude to history and a technical mastery, which allows the kind of, the, as he saw it this or sees it, the kind of symbolic relationship of his tower to bits of London's history, I think is smart architecture. And there it is. Okay, um, now Jeff Kipnis will be able to tell me if this is real or a visualisation, but I just love this image. This is the kind of original basket case building. Needless to say, ladies and gentlemen, designed for a manufacturer who makes basket cases. And all one can say is, well, I think one's a joke, but you don't necessarily want one uh, in every city. But I do think it's an interesting question as to, well, I somehow just feel you wouldn't want one in every city. Why you wouldn't want one um, is a more interesting question. It's a bit like architecture schools. And I think one of the reasons is that a fear of, of replication, this adaptation of, of uh, Munch, um, are we worried by replication? If every architecture school is essentially doing the same thing, is that a problem? And if it is a problem, why is it a problem? Uh, if it's efficacious, what's being taught and the sort of students and the methods and the architectural canon which is being lectured about. What is the nature of the problem uh, of, uh, of repetition? <clears throat> and after all, we don't mind a bit of repetition uh, in San Marco, though if you translate that into uh, local authority housing uh, in London or most towns in Britain, everyone gets very excited and says, you're not supposed to build like that anymore because isn't that the sort of stuff we knock down? And it's the idea of the old city, um, the traditional identifiers, river, bridge, cathedral, square, uh, the lust for certainty, the lust of the traditional, uh, the lust for something that lasted for several centuries, as opposed to dear old London now. Um, because what we say now is this, this beats the medieval city because it's denser. Um, density uh, is king. Or as Fuchs says, actually, it's not density, it's intensity, which is important. Intensita, non densita, um, which becomes another question at night when you look at the city of London. And of course, with the exception of the Barbican, nobody lives there. And the new city, just two images, as I'm sort of semi-substituting for Will Allsop this evening. And um, I apologize for not being Will Allsop. Um, <laughs> And I don't know whether I'd like to be Will Allsop or not. Sometimes I think I would, and sometimes I think I wouldn't. But two images of his attitude to the city, uh, which I think flows from the sort of ideas which this place encourages, because it's free thinking. This is Barnsley. The problem in Barnsley is it spreads out and dilutes. So what does he do? He puts a Roman wall, a medieval wall round it, and says, you cannot build beyond. Uh, you will intensify within certain boundaries, and that will give you uh, an energy uh, to do what previously was dribbling out. And I think that's a very clear metaphor for any architectural school. Where are the, well, firstly, should there be limits? Should there be circumscription? Uh, and if not, why not? And if there is, what's the payoff? And the other thing, I mean, to me, this is a, one of the most considered uh, projects um, from 
this architect, or most architects, dealing with the problem of redundant cities, um, which God knows across Europe is a problem, uh, and it's addressed by shrinking um, the city. And those of you who've been to the Venice Biennale will know that actually a, a rather good, the German pavilion deals with this whole question of, uh, of, of what they call the kind of um, Deutschen landscape, um, which is to do with what happens in industrial places where there aren't so many workers anymore and the industries have gone away and a lot of people are commuting. Um, so this proposition is very simple. You remove large numbers of redundant buildings uh, because they're relatively cheap to buy. Most of them are from the 60s and 70s and are ugly, dumb slab blocks with no redeeming feature. And then you take advantage of uh, topography and topology and hydrology and you create, this is Bradford, Brad, Ford, i.e. is a water-based place which managed to lose its water and you just bring it back again. Um, universal architectural orthodoxy of the moment, water beats tarmac. Um, and another orthodoxy is that cars are bad, um, four wheels bad, um, two pairs of soles or one pair of soles good, um, and the abracadabra of Foster and Partners uh, gives us what we see today and people get excited because my god Trafalgar Square it's so European um, and I think indeed it is and it's probably a good thing so nearly there now um, and the same just on this orthodoxy thing you know grass and hay also beat tarmac this is the London Architecture Biennale down at the bottom of St John Street closed for the weekend the cows liked it they shouldn't have done. They were next to St. John's. They're about to be slaughtered. <laughs> uh, what, do you know what the police said about this? Because there was this idea of driving these cattle down from the office of Bennett's Associates, which is halfway up St. John Street. Um, the police thought that was too far to drive them. And they wanted them drove, if that's the right verb, um, from a bit nearer to sort of Smithfield and, and St. John's. And they threatened the organisers that uh, if there was any attempt to drive them from the Bennett's office, which actually had been the place where cattle um, rested overnight in the 16th century, the building's still there, then the, the cattle would all be confis confiscated under the Confiscation of Cows Act 1962. The organiser would be arrested um, and uh, the police would take no responsibility for civil actions which flowed uh, from all this, but it happened anyway, and just to show that there's nothing that new under the sun, the Lord Mayor's show in the City of London, which has been in continuous production for about a millennium now, I think it missed twice in the Civil War in the 1640s, that's our Civil War, and, and I think in one year in, in, in the Second World War. What I like about this is you get lots of other floats here, it's not just this traditional Lord Mayor's float. And my favourite from a few years ago, with which I conclude my slides, uh, is an image of, um, of a helium-filled balloon um, with a kind of uh, a, an acrobat dancer uh, performing kind of gyrations and this and that, but all under the shade of Christopher Wren St Paul's Cathedral. And I think as a, 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 just as an image, um, I've never liked that thing about those aircraft that you see flying over the pyramid. I've always thought it was a rather cheap shot, really, because they could have shown biplanes, couldn't they, rather than those fighters spewing out that coloured smoke. So I use this one, um, and I hereby complete my slide. So if we can have the lights up, and I just want to say what, to me, those things um, represent. And they are... Uh, they, they represent some architectural orthodoxies, which I then want to look at in relation to perhaps some AA orthodoxies. Uh, density is good, and the rural, frankly, is irrelevant. Cities are cool, suburbs aren't. Cars are bad, pedestrians are virtuous. Roads are an imposition, grass is marvellous. Water beats tarmac. Icons are compulsory, or sometimes basket cases. Growth is good, except in those cities of reduction, but by and large, that's all about architects designing things and people building them, because buildings are the answer, 
house builders, I didn't show anything of theirs because everybody knows that house builders are bad. Clients, of course, are a necessary evil. Any of those buildings could have been built with different clients. Cost is somebody else's business. Back to the cartoon. So structure. Let the engineers take care of that. And, of course, wacky fractals, which I think is particularly relevant to the AA, always beat steady-state Newtonian physics. Where did that get us? Well, it got us to the moon, actually, um, but these days uh, that really doesn't matter, and warping, weaving, deflecting, and folding beat straight lines. A flush beats a straight. Curves are virtuous, according to people who think the gherkins are feminine building. The grid, it's so folksy. What is a grid? What's a medieval grid in a virtual world? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's quite strange. And design at some level is about, or possibly opposed to, desires. Now I want to suggest um, that there are some orthodoxies that uh, are current, that have probably been current for long periods. Not necessarily all of them, but I just want to float them up. Because I take it that this kind of appetizer, if, if appetizer is what it be, to people who are going to discuss these issues in a great deal more depth over the course of the next uh, uh, fortnight. So I don't do this as spoilers because I don't know what they're going to say. But I offer these up because I'll be interested to see whether any of them emerge as themes in the presentations and lectures and discussions which follow. Uh, and my first one, uh, my first orthodoxy, you can't beat the unit system. Now, obviously, the AA invented the unit system, didn't it? So wouldn't it be rather odd if the AA said, well, actually, the unit is dead. Uh, let's have a fresh idea. Um, I pass no comment on that other than as a result of a brief conversation in the bar uh, before this talk to speculate as to whether it's the unit system which is really the important thing, or is it the student-staff or staff-student ratio? And not that those things are mutually exclusive, but it, perhaps one might be clear about what it is, and indeed what the benefits of the unit system are. Because as I mentioned earlier, if the unit system is the AA's unique selling point, um, well, it all ended a long time ago. Uh, it was an AA idea which was taken up and copied with greater or lesser success by many other places uh, all over the world. Okay, let's look at the top of the AA. The chair of the AA, now I advisedly don't use the word chairman because I'm sure the AA will have a chair uh, who is not a man one day. The AA chair is a necessary SAR. That's to say, the AA is in need of strong leadership from somebody who, and we're going to come on to what the constitutional description of the current arrangement might be a little later on. Uh, but the necessary SAR uh, is there uh, because without that smack of firm leadership, as they used to say about Margaret Thatcher, the whole place would fall apart because architects of course are chaotic creative people and given half a chance they will ignore the benefits of stasis and the taxidermist and they go whizzing off into a world where anyone can do anything irrespective of cost time uh, or legals here's another orthodoxy academic and administrative organization and life is a single thing and should be governed individually rather than separately this is something which is taxed the devisers of constitutions across the centuries. I mean, they're trying to sort it out in Europe now. And as usual, with all the arrogance that Europe can muster, uh, we ignore what the Americans actually learn and fought out in blood to learn, which is that there are better and worse ways uh, of doing these things. And having unified systems, on the whole, doesn't seem to be one of them. Okay, here's another one. I'm sorry to have to raise this one. The school community is a font of all knowledge and wisdom. Well, having looked at the AA as a, as a, as a journalist and observer and occasional counsellor over the last 32 years, all I can say is, you've got to be joking. 
uh, the school community is not a font of all knowledge. There are usually a few well-informed people um, who sometimes tell you what the truth is, and then you have to go and sort of check it out for yourself, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. As to the question of being a font of wisdom, which suggests that the school community can periodically, or every day for all I know, um, say what should happen and why it should happen be correct, I think that's beyond any organisation. <coughs> but let's move on to this. The AA is a democracy. Is it? Is the school community a democracy? Um, uh, well, it has democratic elements to it, certainly. At certain points, the school community can, within certain limits, and, the, and I'll come on to the limits later, actually choose, for better or worse, to entirely change the direction of the school. Um, but it's quite an odd democracy that actually <coughs> owes the circumscription um, to an organisation called Council, um, which is elected by a completely separate, to some extent, group of people. It has things called members. Well, I mean, they're not part of the school community. How come they get a vote? Um, is it generosity? Um, is it uh, structural disorganisation? Is it tradition? Um, well, tradition doesn't take long, even in this school, um, to become established fact. At the AA Council, and I do think this is a view quite widely held, is a necessary nuisance. Oh, can't they just sort of... Well, it's either, can't they contribute more, either money or some other rather unspecified thing, um, or why is it that they have such a significant role? We never see them, and then they come along and tell us who the new chair's going to be. Well, they don't actually, but they come along and tell us what the method by which we find a chair is going to be. Or they don't quite do that. They say what the school community has to take into account since the AA councillors as trustees are personally liable for the AA's debts. And if you've ever been personally liable for the debts of an institution um, other than yourself, you'll realise how troubling uh, that that might be. And the last in this little bit, the selection of a chairman is a traditional process. Well, all I can tell you is it isn't, and it changes every time it's done. It's always different. It isn't written down anywhere. Uh, there are no rules. The rules can, to some extent, be made up as you go along, bearing in mind the constitutional and legal proprieties and, indeed, obligations of the council itself. OK, the AA is an international school. And that's because it takes people from all over the place. Um, well, does that mean it's not a British school? Um, come to that, does it mean it's not a global school? It's somewhere in between. Or another way of describing this would, it used to be a British school, and then it became a kind of semi-colonialist international school, and then it abandoned all that because Mrs Thatcher wouldn't let British students have grants anymore. And as is the way of things, successful institutions have to find new markets. Uh, so the old English-speaking colonial thing went out of the window, and now it's global. I'll leave the question uh, in the air. The AA is the best school in the world. Well, if it is, perhaps somebody can say why, or define what best might be. What do you do it by? Numbers? Um, ease of attracting teaching staff? satisfaction ratings from the students, percentage you get diplomas without a retake. I haven't got the faintest sign. Perhaps it doesn't matter. But I think for the AA, it's always thought of itself, certainly in my time, as if it's not the best school in the world. It's a very special place indeed, to which we might come back. Uh, theory and practice have little to do with each other. Well, I'm not sure about this. I mean, I'm just flagging this one up because I'm much more interested in theory and practices because clearly, well, we'll come on to why that might be more interesting a bit later on. But going round the show with, as it were, the amateur client, you say, well, can they actually build this sort of stuff? And you have to say, oh, yeah, definitely, not a problem. And they say, well, can I go and see it? And so, yes, let's get a ticket to Yokohama. Um, so what is the relationship of the things, as it were, you see at the end of year show 
and product out there? Is it just a time lag? Ten years down the line, will the world look like that? Here's a very practical one. Year contracts for staff are useful. Now, I flag this one up because it's clearly controversial, and I've added in brackets here, and are they legal? Um, these are questions which will be surely addressed one way or another in a litigious world. Here's a nice general one. The AA can do whatever it likes. Can it? What can it do that other people can't do? I mean, is it that unique? Can it do anything actually other than have a vote periodically if it sort of fancies a bit of a change at the top? That might be enough. The AA is about being avant-garde. But that's a problem, isn't it? Because if you, oh, I go to this avant-garde architecture school. How do you know you're avant-garde? We do everything differently. Do you? What, is your summer show that different to summer shows here and here and here and here? Well, yes, because we take a different uh, position. But all of you, is it unit X? The AA is based in Bedford Square. Now, I really like this one because <coughs> there's a sort of assumption I think correct on the part of council that to inject certainty into the AA's financial and locational future, it would be a really smart idea to buy a chunk of lease so that the school is not at the mercy of the Bedford estate, likely to be thrown out on the streets at, uh, oh, I don't know, five or ten years' notice or some short period like that. But I think as soon as you raise the question, the AA is based in Bedford Square. Well, yeah, it is. That's its postal address. Well, it hasn't always been in Bedford Square. Is it going to be here forever? Why should it be here forever? What's the lease worth? Should you go to Cairo? You know, or Birmingham? Uh, in other words, in best AA sense, if, you, if you're looking at what's up for grabs educationally, you better do what the AA always does. Just push it. Push it. You know, why are you going to stay here? Is this the best place to have uh, a school? Uh, is this the best place to run big lectures? OK, so here's some AA propositions. And you'll probably get a flavour from me about my view, but it doesn't really matter what my view is because I'm flagging them up. So these can be propositions or questions. And my first one is actually about the structure um, because I thought about this because I was trying to think, well, what is this like? Because clearly... It's not like any other architecture school in the world where students and teachers can decide who their SAR is going to be, if SAR it be. No one else operates like this. Peter Cook told me it only took 20 minutes to sort out his job down at the Bartlett. And, uh, you know, I had this conversation. And I thought, well, I'm glad it takes the AA year. I mean, speed is not necessarily virtuous. I mean, I'm sure it was in his case, and it suited them. It was convenient. So what have we got here? We've got a constituency which splits into two parts. The members, the sort of great unwashed out there who used to go to the AA at some stage, or sort of wannabes who pay their £70 a year, then there's the school community. And, and, and they get a vote and they can you know, vote for their mates. By the way, the council doesn't look very international, does it? I mean, I know all of them. They're all in, they're all in EC1 or, or N1. I mean, they're all mates. That's what's great about it, on the one hand. Uh, and then there's the school community, which comes into focus in relation to its own governance, you might say. Now, the nearest I've been able to get to a sort of working model for what this represents, and this is why location and roots and origins are important, I think this is pretty much a British model of a constitutional monarchy. Now, with one exception, which is there is no hereditary principle. Um, that's absolutely clear. The generational thing just, I don't think, would work. It's conceivable, but I don't think it would work. So forget the hereditary stuff. But other than that, you've got a certain power invested in the chair, but the power derives not from the office, but from the consti those constituencies, and in particular, the school community. Uh, so on this model, um, the school community, and to some extent through its 
House of Commons Council have this person, the king, who has quite a lot of power to do quite a lot of stuff, can make policies, can change direction, um, and as you, as you will remember, those of you who know your history, declare war, spend money, and actually do quite <coughs> foolish things as well as quite good things, provided, and for as long as, the constituency who put them there in the first place are happy. And when they cease to be happy, you're out. And the model for this, for those who are interested, was the removal of James II in 1688, 1689, and the invitation to William of Orange to come over and be King of England. A defining moment why Britain never had a revolution uh, in the 19th century, because from that moment on, it was clear where power truly resided. And it resided in, if you like, the democratic or the representative institutions uh, of the country at large. Now, the A, of course, moved on a bit because it, it allows a sort of more of a mass vote on things on certain occasions. But I do think that the relationship between the chair and council and the school community, they are, a sort of, they are on a sort of constitutional uh, model. And because of that, uh, let me ask a question. Should policy and the executive be separated? Uh, because it's quite a curious thing to have somebody who's responsible for policy and direction and all the rest of it to be meddling and fiddling in the minutiae of, of, uh, of the structure of people who are there to make sure that the machine runs smoothly. That's to say, government as opposed to civil service, separation of powers. Now, because of that question, should the school community be formally represented on council? When I was on council, w the frequently people from the school community would turn up, um, Peter Salter for one, and sort of lounge about asking incredibly difficult questions right in the middle of some, some complicated, knotty problem that the council was trying to deal with. And that was part of AA fun, because it could be a student or a teacher, they could come to any council meeting, and I think still can, and ask what the hell they want, um, and in a sense, you don't get much more democratic than that. So, you could have formal representation. Is that better? You know, you elect three people who go and sit at the council meeting. Can you still go there? I don't know. Um, but if you can still go there, what's the point of having representatives as well? Are you there as an observer? And all that nitty-gritty stuff. So I just flag it up. Now, the chair could be a practitioner, possibly, is that a good thing? Is that acceptable? Would that be acceptable to teaching staff to have somebody who said, well, actually, I believe the role of king can be combined with the role of going and designing buildings somewhere. Is that smart? Is that good? Is that different? What are the other models? Is it a point of difference? Or is it a really bad idea, and that's why no other school, by and large, does it too much? What does globalisation mean? Does it mean that the AA actually, because of globalisation, needs to be more local? Uh, and I owe this, 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 uh, this question, really, to Mark Cousins, because he's saying as, as, as globalisation gets jammed down your throat, actually what you want more and more is to find something particular and great, which is local and rooted, rather than just everything being everywhere all the time. The same difference everywhere as the postmodernists used to say. Can education combine with practices, especially bringing international perspectives? The students at this school have a huge resource of knowledge and experience about their own countries, which could be, uh, I was going to use the word exploited, I mean that in a good sense, by the practices in this town. Would this be a way of bridging certain gaps between theory and practice, between studying and working, between young and old, etc., etc. And turning to a much more academic thing, can the tyranny of the 24-hour clock and extend that to the seven-day week, the eight-week semester or whatever it is at the AA and the academic year, can that be disrupted in some way in the interest of things that the school wants to do in, 
in the case of research, or things that other people are interested in and the school is interested as well. And come to that, can undergraduate and graduate work, um, how separate should that be as far as research is concerned? So should the AA accentuate difference, I'm using the word difference in a kind of normal English term, um, in terms of A being international, B, um, and there, this is a question which is going to be addressed later in this series, um, if it is international, how does accreditation work? Does it need to be accredited in this country? At the extreme, what happens if you don't get accreditation here? Is that a problem? Where do students go? It sounds as though it would be. And as I mentioned earlier, is the school moving from um, a British through an international and then to a, a kind of global condition and what might uh, that mean? The question of the avant-garde, well, as mentioned earlier, um, you can you describe a school as being avant-garde or a unit? Isn't it self-defeating? Um, to be avant-garde means you have to be opposition to what exists now and you've already pulled the rug from under thought process. What you're saying is, hey, I'm going to be different. In other words, you just became predictable and the avant-garde uh, is anything uh, but. Could the AA, just two more things now, could the AA ever seriously contemplate abandoning the spirit in which it was founded. And the spirit in which it was founded was, of course, the desire on the part of students to escape from what they regarded uh, as the incompetent and unwelcome architectural <coughs> education they were getting from practice in order to create their own institution. And the AA, is it fundamentally about ideas and is it about its own ideas, for good or bad, as opposed to the ideas of others? So my, my conclusion, my broad conclusion, which wouldn't cover by any means the orthodoxies that I've mentioned or the questions that I've raised, is really a, a feeling about what makes certain institutions or certain products uh, improve and strengthen, if not necessarily grow in a kind of um, a numbers or, or a money sense, which is that. So this would be my final sort of concluding proposition and question. Shouldn't the AA try to be more like itself? That's to say, more London, uh, more international, more about its own ideas without going into a kind of lager of nothing else cares, of course. And in this instance, um, it's not a question of less is more, but if that spirit and attitude, which seems to me to have pervaded the AA certainly for the last 30 years, is to survive and strengthen, then you want concentration rather than dilution and you want a rootedness rather than a kind of unconscious diaspora of ideas going out to fringes and to organisations who themselves have been beneficiaries of the AA's history and thinking. Thank you very much. Okay, Paul, thank you very much indeed. I, I can't think of a better way uh, to start this series um, than the way in which kind of Paul sketch, sketches, apart from anything else, a kind of whole vast series of questions. Um, I mean, I was kind of trying to keep a note of them as we went through them. Uh, I think many of them actually, in a way, are... Uh, at least hopefully addressed in the coming fortnight. Let me just run through kind of some of the questions that, that he kind of asked in no particular kind of order of significance. 
<coughs> one was the unit system, one was the nature of the relationship between the academic and the administrative, one was the nature of the school community, one was its relation to council, one was the status of the AA as an international school. We say it, but what do we mean? Uh, that's probably linked to, um, why do we tell people the AA is the best school in the world? And even more obscurely, why do people say we are? Um, I mean, what on earth's going on when that happens? What is the relation between theory and practice? What, how do we want to think about the staff in terms of contract? Can the AA do what it likes? What is the significance to the AA of being in Bedford Square? I think architects ought to have more than they usually say about that <coughs> question. Especially because I think the bid to go to Birmingham, I can tell you what the vote is now. <laughs> to go to Birmingham, nil. <coughs> Certainly not Birmingham, Alabama, no. <laughs> so we're presented with a kind of wide range. Now, you know, the school doesn't have a great reputation for being a great questioner after lectures. Uh, and it's got to kind of reinvent that. Um, now's the time to ask Paul questions. But they don't have to be kind of questions in the sense they can be as much kind of comments. If, if there are any of those issues which people want to kind of even now kind of take up, now's the time to do it. And we have about, I think, about half an hour uh, of planned question time. Uh, do we have a, an ambient mic? Yeah. Who would like to start the questioning? It's okay, you'll all stay here till someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no one leaving this room. Oh, here we go. Paul, you, yeah. you raised this um, idea of a parallel between the Crown and Parliament uh, in, in talking about constitution. I think that it, it's very important that we try and think through the model that we got better and see what might be fixed. One of the things that seems to be really problematic with almost any models of constitution that one looks at, whether it's Crown and Parliament or, or other ones, is they have an awful tendency to become bureaucratized quite quickly and to tie themselves up in more and more procedures and balances and relationships. For good or ill, one of the things that has happened in the AA over the past 30 years is that a lot of that hasn't happened, either with benign dictatorship or, or, or your, your, your sort of SAR model that you, you mentioned. And I wonder whether we could sort of speculate a bit on whether, it, uh, whether it's inevitable if we try and get more careful about how we would make a constitution that more clearly or better or somehow more effectively establish the relationship between all the different parts, we wouldn't inevitably slip into a much more bureaucratic and, and in fact, sort of destroy the thing that we're trying to do by doing it. I mean, it's just, I'm, I'm just sort of concerned to op begin to kick that problem around. I don't know what, what you might think about that. Well, I think this is the, this is the, the classic difference between um, those people who believe written constitutions are useful, uh, which I don't, and those, those people who believe that, I'm not saying I'm against constitutions, but it's having it written down and it's codified and you can go to law on it, as opposed to dealing with things that have arisen and are thought to be likely to arise and having ways of dealing with them which are written down. Now, one, one, it's an interesting thing. One of the biggest lies in British public life is that there's no such thing as a British constitution. And I always ask people who say that, um, it's usually at the sort of parties where they tell you nothing's improved since the 18th century, and I always say, what about dentistry? But it's like, it's like you know, 
if there's no British constitution written down, how do we know we're entitled to have an election every five years? I mean, it's mind-numbing. Of course there's a British constitution. It's just written down in a number of different places, dealing with different conditions and circumstances as they arise, like general elections or local elections or why you pay tax. And I think the, the worst thing that the AA could do, actually, would be, be to get bound up in trying to have a kind of all-purpose, all-singing-and-dancing constitution as, de as de devised by itself. First, it's doomed to failure, because people at the AA are not constitutional theorists, um, with the possible exception of Mark. And Mark certainly wouldn't want to write it down, because actually, the first time it got put into, used in practice, it would all fall apart anyway, because people in the school community are not constitutional theorists. They want to know, actually, can I go to that meeting or not? Um, and you don't need a constitution uh, for that. So I think that the, I would go back to my thing about the AA should be more like itself. And, the, and OK, I agree, you err on the <coughs> side of chaos as opposed to stasis. Um, but on the other hand, provided that the principles are robust, that's to say that the school is run legally. And I should say here that the, the um, one powerful argument for having a council at all, and you'll notice that I didn't suggest that the council should be abolished, is that the AA uh, is a charity legal and it has to have certain things because if it doesn't then actually you know you might as well look for another school because someone's going to sell a lease um, cash it in and just pack the whole thing up so you do have there are certain givens that you have to have but beyond that you know one of the great things about it, about the AA is up to a point that it can do, do what it likes um, but writing, con writing convoluted constitutions, I think, isn't one of them. And therefore the trick, which is the architectural connection, which is you just design the thing you want. You take the dilemma of bureaucracy and rigidity and you just design it out. And that's why I think an architecture school can set up its own structures, um, which can be quite informal, without going the whole hog and trying to write everything down, which is bound to and in disaster. I mean, the, the problem really, I think, I mean, as a supplementary question to that is, you know, if you, if you admire the British Constitution because it's not written down, <coughs> therefore think the AA Constitution should not be written down, nonetheless, uh, <coughs> how can I put it dis discreetly, Tony Blair has not yet said, <laughs> do we really have to have an election? <laughs> Uh, no, nor after it, you say, well, what does that signify anyway? Um, I mean, I do think that, that, that we do need, um, I mean, actually, in fact, the fact that we have an election every five years uh, is a written part. It's, a, it's part of statute law. Uh, it kind of relates to kind of the timing of elections. Um, I agree with you that it would be extraordinarily foolish uh, of such a febrile institution to try to have one of those constitutions that covers a lot of issues uh, because a constitution at that level can't arbitrate uh, you know when when matters are kind of contentious but I think there is I mean I think one of the tasks that we I mean this is to, to ask you a question in a way which we do need to do before we have uh, a selection of a chair is to provide a kind of overall framework of governance, including, you know, a clear statement about elections and whatever. Because if there's one thing I think which poisons institutions, it's kind of a lack of clarity uh, about the kind of rules and, and the system under which people kind of operate. No, I think that's a fair point. I think the distinction between governance and a constitution is an important one. I mean, to give you one example, I personally don't believe anybody should be on the AA Council who doesn't embrace personal financial liability for the AA's debts. You can't have... I, I personally don't think you can have Class B voting members of the Council who don't have the responsibility. I think it's dangerous in, in, in principle and in practice, because in extremists, which is the point you always need to look at, you could have three, five people who are voting, knowing that it won't affect them one way or the other, whereas all the other people who are voting are looking to have their houses taken away, to use the extreme example. 
Um, so, you know, and that, that, that is, I think, is a matter of governance and should be dealt with like that. Ditto this question about, I mean, you can make an argument either way as to whether you split administration and academic um, or whether you com combine them. I think the important thing is you look at it and have a clear, it's, it's kind of part of the job description, whoever is coming in as chair, even though you might put that paragraph on the end, this will, of course, be subject to periodic review with the chair. I mean, that's what's great about the British Constitution. There are always let-outs, which mean that you can change things if you need to without having to change the entire Constitution. Um, and this, is, this seems to me to be a sort of... It's a, it's a forgiving structure, if I can put it like that. And it's a, it's a kind of loose structure, which I think suits, suits the AA, because the AA is a kind of loose structure sort of place and you wouldn't want to, it seems to me, you wouldn't want to lose that sort of spirit by having absolute clarity on day one and absolute unclarity the first time the thing got tested. The last thing you need is arbitration and courts and paid advisors to decide whether somebody can do this or can do that. And governance is, is an entirely different matter. And in fact, I mean, the, I think the, the, pa the interesting parallel is that what Blair has done by using special advisors has, I mean, has actually, I wouldn't say it's subverted, but it's done something very odd to the relationship between civil servants and government, i.e. the administrators and the elected, because all of a sudden those people who are about making the machine tick, they all think they're special advisors and they, all, they are becoming in short politicised. Um, I think you don't need it. Now, could we take more questions? Edouard, but I'm really, I mean, if students think they're off the hook not asking, they're quite wrong. Edouard Lemaitre, Secretary of the AA. I, I apologize, Mark, I missed your introduction, so this might not be relevant. But um, I did think that one of the unique aspects of the AA school is that it's not part of university. I don't know of any other schools that are in a similar position. And I think that is significant. Um, another point that, I, that you, you prompted me to think about, in terms of the um, <coughs> context of all this activity, is really uh, the fact that the school community is highly volatile. And uh, probably a third of its, of its uh, makeup of about 600 people changes every year and I, I wonder whether you've considered what impact that might have on uh, the longer term process. Well two parts of that. The first thing I think is great it's not part of a university and in fact the way that architectural education is going in universities um, I think it's, it's, it's something to be embraced. Um, my first encounters with the AA were when Imperial College were attempting a sort of takeover um, with the active support, if not connivance, of, of the significant numbers of people within the AA itself. Um, and for those who don't know the history, there was an almighty row which really led to the current sort of dispensation in terms of electing chairman and so on and so forth. Um, and Alvin Boyarsky uh, came in. So I think steer clear of those systems if you, <laughs> if you possibly can. I don't really see that they've got anything hugely impressive to, to offer. And at a time when it looks as though that uh, British um, accreditation, um, part three is looking increasingly shaky, um, pretty questionable under EU rules, and sooner or later, somebody's gonna say, I have a right to call myself an architect in Britain even though I don't have part three. Um, at which point, I think the AA should immediately strengthen its part three course and um, perhaps it should make it compulsory so that you know when you employ someone with an AA dip that they've done the extra year and have passed their exams. I think that would be a very AA thing to do rather than um, <laughs> just uh, a thought, Mark. And, uh, uh, but, you, you know, it, it's, it's do architects need to know about party wars and legal stuff like that? Well, I think they most certainly do if they don't want to get sued to kingdom come. Now, the question of school volatility, well, I always think that those things, it's like, 
oh my god, all, the, all these new people here, we can't possibly have a system where there is new people who don't know anything about the AA. Well, I think actually that's exactly what you can do, because the founding students, they didn't know anything about the AA, didn't know what they were doing when they founded it. They didn't have a problem with that. The people who come here are bright. Um, if they're interested, they'll find out about it, and if they're not, they'll avoid the vote. I, I mean, I just don't think there's anything to be, to be frightened about there. And there are sort of, um, there are enough wiser, wiser heads around that in the event of a kind of, let's say, a first year came in who worked out, um, as I think some students did in 1968 or 69, one or two of them in this room, that the small leverage of power they had with their numbers could have absolutely upset the apple cart. Well, I would say that's probably show business, and if push came to shove, for example, if Imperial made another bid, um, of course, Imperial tried to take over the Bartlett a couple of years ago, and what I say about that, another failed attempt, which is imperialism just doesn't work. <laughs> um, I'm Julia King. As I'm on my year out, so I guess I'm a non-community member, which makes the only reason I'm here is someone's search committee. And um, we're sort of spending this whole year process to, um, you know, enable the community to vote and to find a chairman. And I guess it's not in the Constitution and it's not democratic um, legally. So I'm wondering if you think that questioning this structure is going to sort of like unbalance or affect this democratic process, whether that should be questioned. And if that's okay, and just, I don't know what you think about that, like, well, I think it would, be, it would be an odd sort of person who, who really wanted to be chair of this place to imagine that these sorts of conversations and the possibility of some sort of flux wasn't going to happen. I mean, that surely is part of the attraction. Uh, if it was the sort of person who wanted everything cut and dried and decided in five minutes and a written contract where everybody knew exactly where, the, where they were going to be for the next ten years, then they wouldn't be wanting to come here. So, I mean, that would be my first thought about that. Plus, anyone who's interested will know exactly what's going on. They'll be seeing what's going to come out of this fortnight. They'll be watching it if they're interested enough to come here. If they're not interested, it doesn't matter. The question about, um, uh, you know, the legality or the, the democracy about those things, I mean, I, I think they're quite big words to, to use, really. I mean, this is a search to find somebody who wants to be head of this place. And they can't come here condition free. Um, there will be a salary, there will be terms and conditions like any other job. So that's, that will be what it will be. And it seems to me the interesting issue which is raised by what's happening for this fortnight is that there may be certain aspects about the nature and responsibilities of the job which may be different at the end of this process than they are this evening. And it seems to me that's perfectly proper. And the reason it's perfectly proper is I think in, in reviewing uh, these constitutional matters, in finding out and checking um, about the, the really important legals, which, for example, I mean, everyone assumes because you, know, you get your audit done every year and you get a clean bill of health and the money's all right, that everything you're doing is legal. <coughs> well, that's not necessarily the case, especially for charities. And the reason for that is that charity law changes attitudes to what you can do, what you should do, best bits of, of governance. I mean, at Cade, to give a simple example, I mean, we lost our chairman. I mean, okay, we're not a charity, but we're, we're, a, we're a public body. We don't make money. We lost our chairman. We've had to rewrite the sort of rules about who we can appoint um, because of a big punch-up and a fight um, about whether it was appropriate to behave in a certain sort of way. Now, I think it's, uh, it, from that point of view, the AA is in a much calmer position. Um, you didn't lose a chairman over that sort of issue. Um, the, the, the decision was made that you prefer to have somebody new, and I think you can, you can sail along in those waters, and um, this then becomes a question of governance. And personally, if you took an extreme position and said, right, we're going to separate administration from academic policy, will allow a part-time chair and we'll do a whole load of other things. For every person that you exclude from considering the job, you, there might be someone else who gets attracted. So I, th I think this is a decent each-way bet to make sure the legal pies are in order in respect of 
the bits that are legal, the, the, the charity thing, the rules, just to give them a once over, make sure they still apply. And then after that, you know, a good chair is going to cope with that. A question maybe more from the rear of the room. I mean, it hasn't put its hand up yet. The rear of the room. It will do. <laughs> if it knows what's good for it. Um, good evening. I'm Francois. I'm part of the... I'm a year out student as well, and I'm part of the search committee as well. I have one uh, question about the community. <coughs> My understanding is <coughs> of the DA community, it's been he, he narrated from the 70s, kind of a, um, at a time maybe where that idea of community was slightly more uh, um, surrounding us, I mean, surrounding that people, those people at that time. And nowadays, I think the outside world is slightly different. Uh, how come this stays relevant for the school and how come that idea of community which is a structure for the school, so how come the, the structure of the school can influence actually the, uh, the educational part? Um, is the, the structure of the school itself should be part of the course or, or should it influence the course or is it something which is totally detached from it? Well, my, my, my observation about that is that the AA and its organisation and indeed its building um, do indeed influence what goes on. I mean, the first time I came to this building, it's like the old TV programme upstairs, downstairs. There seem to be all these groups of sort of servants and students in different rooms who might see each other in the bar and then vanish off into what we used to call for a long time, I don't think it's quite like that now, the unit system, we used to call them the isolation units because you get these little clusters of people who'd only talk to each other um, and then occasionally would come to sort of group things. That's why the bar was so important, of course, as the great uh, hub uh, and activity. So I think, indeed, it does, it does affect. I mean, if you had an open plan school, I think unit system would be slightly more difficult, not impossible, but I mean, it would be slightly more difficult to operate. Uh, it wouldn't be as much fun. But your general point about the circumstances in which the idea about the role of the school community in relation to the AA arose in certain circumstances, and they, they arose <coughs> in a spirit of uh, rebellion and disgust at what was going on, but also very much to fight for an institution that people loved, I, I would use that word advisedly. Um, and it's true, that was then and this is now. Um, but I think the fact that the external circumstances are different um, doesn't change the fact that, uh, that, that the school community can be whatever it wants to be. <coughs> and I think it's, it's, it's as valid now in, in, a, in a period when there isn't that sort of rebellion. However, in a period when there are very big questions being asked about the future uh, of the school and the future of the chair and these relationships. And I think one can't assume that, um, you know, it can't be 1968 every year. It doesn't need to be. Um, and if there are periods of general placidity on the part of the school community, it may be because people are much more interested in their work. Uh, and with, uh, I don't mean that in a dull sense, but they're actually interested in issues other than the kind of what can sometimes be, frankly, the stultifying minutiae of actually running institutions. I mean, that's what you want administrative staff for. Now, to finish off, if, if what you're saying is, well, actually, the real role of the school community should be to determine what is taught here, uh, well, that is another question entirely. Of course, part of the community are directly responsible for it because they're the teachers. But I don't think you could have a circumstance in, in which the school community tries to tell um, a chair of any merit or substance what it's going to be taught or how it's going to be taught. Because that sort of thing is precisely what you want to have dialogue about. And I personally believe the relationship between the school community and the chair is the kind of missing element here. And I don't think you're going to get it by having as such, I mean you might get other things, but I don't think you will get that as such simply by having representatives on AA Council. Now happily the things aren't mutually exclusive, but I would have thought a wise chair uh, would make it his or her business to have very extensive conversations with uh, the school community all the time. 
um, in a sense like any good politician. And it's, not it's noticeable when Prime Ministers stop visiting the House of Commons tea room and talking to their troops that trouble starts. Um, and usually, if you have the opportunity to speak to the chair and they talk to you, then if there's a problem looming, um, it gets nipped in the bud. Sorry, Irene and then Jeff. Um, Irene Scalbert, General Studies. Um, Paul, you made a uh, tantalizing comment about um, CA possibly benefiting from being uh, more like itself. And I wonder whether I could prod this a little bit more. And perhaps one way to, to do it would be to ask you, as somebody who has been uh, a regular observer at the AA, and also as somebody, perhaps even more so, you know, um, uh, in a pole position to observe what is going on outside the AA, I wonder whether you could um, uh, say something about the alignment or misalignment between the AA and what is going on outside, because inevitably there is bound to be in this some kind of answer to the first comments which I referred to. Well, I think this is about the AO's relation with, uh, with its city, and happily, because London is a, a world city, as they say, um, it's not a question of, oh, well, why can't AA students be more British? Um, uh, because actually to be more British would, in a sense, be to be more international. Um, but what, what I think that the AA in spirit um, might consider is that instead of being a global school which happens to be in Bedford Square in, the, in London, that actually what it says is, well, we're rooted in a certain place uh, and rather because we're global, thinking that we could be anywhere else, so it doesn't really matter where we are, that actually one exploits uh, the particular uh, and the local <coughs> and makes a conscious effort uh, make a conscious effort to engage with the things that are going on around. Now I think that just in the same way as that um, a kind of um, rather catty phrase about isolation units, but from observation, I mean most architecture schools for whatever reason don't have a particularly conscious engagement with the cities in which they reside. Um, and if you think, let's say, oh I don't know, if you take somewhere like Plymouth where God knows they've got enough problems about sorting out the, um, you know, the legacy of this failed planning policy and that pedestrian policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the people always missing from the picture is the architecture school. They don't get asked. Now, I think that you can say, okay, well, it's the politician's fault, but to me, that's just like saying it's the client's fault. I think that architecture schools and their reputation actually put off politicians regarding them as a resource. Now I think that uh, in London, I mean Ken Livingston and the GLA, they have an architecture and urbanism unit. Um, you know, those people are entirely familiar with what the AA does. I think that London should be approaching the AA and seeing what it's up to, seeing where its areas of research are leading, you know, looking at the projects, sometimes specific projects for bits of London, to see what could be gathered from that. But to make that initiative, because there are several schools of architecture and politicians by and large, I think quite distrustful about education and universities, um, and might actually be very inhibited if they came round the summer show and just think, oh, well, there's nothing here for us because it's all people redesigning the whole of southern China. So therefore, I think there has to be s an engagement on, on the part of the school in a, in a kind of... Um, in a sort of refined manner. I mean, it's not an open invitation to anyone. Hey, guys, come and see what we're doing and exploit us. It's like thinking about who's doing stuff that's interesting that we might be able to contribute to, and with or without funding. I think it has to be ideas-driven. And I think it is a way, precisely because the AA is different, and it's not part of the university system, it's not part of all those usual bits and pieces, that it could be a much freer agent um, and I think potentially play a more engaged role in, in, thinking about, in thinking about London. If there are smart little schemes, well, they'll probably happen anyway. 
but th you know, I can remember student <coughs> projects, you know, from years and years and years ago, which are now either orthodoxy or people are saying, well, why don't we do it like that? And you kind of think, well, you know, this is where we came in. You know, there are people sitting here who've done all this stuff, you know, who were designing cities 25 years ago, actually getting to design some chunks of cities now. But all that resource and intellectual effort um, lying fallow as far as the politicians are concerned. And if you look at, you know, you look at the stuff on the Lower League Valley, you know, these, to me, these are pure AA schemes being rolled out. The Olympic bid, the whole thing, it's all there. And there's a, f a final point on there, just to say what these connections might be. At the Venice Bernardi in the British Pavilion, which was criticised by one critic as being, oh, well, you know, nine positions and nine architects, can't there just be one position? You know, isn't nine too many? What a dreary, bloody point of view. And I think the point about the, a the AA, I mean, incidentally, most of the exhibitors uh, did their time at the AA, is that, no, there shouldn't be one point of view. You don't want an, a an AA point of view. You want at least nine, and probably 99. Um, the more, the merrier, as, as, probably, as, as, as long as they're delivered with verve and with a real engagement, and in the certain knowledge that engagement with politicians and other institutions will probably most of the time be disappointing, um, but the affair <coughs> might be fun while it lasts. You're right, the AA would want one exhibitor exhibiting nine points of view. <laughs> um, the last question from Jeff, and then I think actually uh, we'll move up into the bar uh, and continue just, the discussion. Just there. curiosity, and the question has the danger of sounding obsequious, and I don't mean it to be that. Um, and I've known you a long time, and one of the things I know best about you is that you're blunt and honest. Um, and so I want to ask you this. I, I, was listen I was very curious about the questions you asked about the AA for, for both their content but also their formulation. Some of them I decided to reformulate. <laughs> and I want to just personally ask you one of the questions. Let's say you have a questionnaire and uh, you feel like it's important to participate in the questionnaire, honestly answer it bluntly. And one of the questions you ran across is, in your opinion, and without having to justify it, what's the best architectural school in the world? What would you put down? Well, from a position of profound ignorance, because I just don't get around enough, um, if I was forced to say what's the best architectural school in the world, then I would say the AA. But the, the reason I would say it is a sort of negative. I've never heard anyone make a claim for any other school anywhere that theirs is the best school. However, <laughs> and I, that's... That's simply because you haven't gone to I don't know, but when you, when you meet architects around and about, you know, whether they're visiting or whether you meet them overseas, I've never, ever heard anybody saying, well, obviously that school's the best school in the world. It's much more likely, whereas I have heard people saying, well, not precisely AA is the best school in the world, but the AA is completely different. And, oh, well you know, that's what they're doing at the AA. And it's kind of a mark of approbation precisely because it's such an unusual place through its history and, and through its, its organisation. And I think that the, the reason... Uh, so the, the other bit of that is, however, what people do say is which kind of teachers are doing really interesting things in certain places at certain times. And it's a bit like, you know, that awful embarrassing thing if... if you know, parents sometimes ring us up at the Architects Journal and say, well, you know, my, my, my son's thinking of going to architecture school, which one should he apply to? And I think, Jesus, you know, what are you supposed to say? Because, uh, yes, you can say, well, you can, you can always reel off just for a quick answer to get them off the phone. But the truth is, what you'd really want to know is what the student was like. And then who, if you could predict it, who would be teaching uh, in those institutions and what they would be teaching, and that is inherently unpredictable. But I think the, r the reason why the AA is such an interesting place is that it's precisely those moments in its history where, where it could have sunk, joined up with somebody else, or just ceased, that there were enough people, by and large, al well, actually almost all of them, with some sort of roots in the AA, having been taught having taught here or been taught here, that at certain critical moments in its history, not just the Imperial College thing, 
for that moment when the bailiffs were at the gate. And um, let's be frank, um, Charlotte, rest in peace, actually took the computers home because she felt certain that the bailiffs would be in stripping the place out. Now, don't worry, students, this was all a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, your, your, your year fees are absolutely uh, secure and safe. But, you know, these were extraordinary times. Looking back on it, you think, my God, how did the place survive? And I think it survived because, at root, it survived because its mainspring was not a conventional desire to have university teaching. It sprang out of youthful mixture of enthusiasm and naivety and determination and created something which has been robust enough um, to survive, um, survive the British system, um, survive the state enrolment of polytechnics and art school, survive the dreaded 3A levels or you're out, um, it survived sort of part one, part two and part three, it survived the RIB, it survived the ARB, it, it's like a plant that I, I suspect is too strong now um, to, uh, to wither away without some extraordinary events we could only guess at. And I think for, for, for that reason, um, I would say, well, it might not be the best, and there's probably no such thing as the best, but it's kind of the most special. Okay, now, um, I think we should move up. So, second, but, but before I actually thank Paul, I do want to kind of make one observation which bears on the rest of these sessions. As I say, we have genuinely on your behalf labored uh, to put this together. And indeed, you can imagine, you know, that there were many difficulties getting this year underway. We're very lucky to have, you know, a committee, the IMG, uh, to work hard on your behalf. We're very lucky to kind of recruit the enthusiasm of the search committee to operate on your behalf. My kind of, you know, if, I, if, I, if someone said, do you have a nightmare about how something wouldn't go right in the year, it would undoubtedly be this, that in respect to all these things, that there was an insufficient student voice, an insufficient participation, an insufficient inhibition at a meeting like this. It's impossible for me to kind of let the, the first of these evenings pass by without observing that either most of the uh, interventions came either from teachers, prospective teachers, or people already on committees. And I really, I don't know what to say except that, you know, when you're <coughs> here in the next fortnight, I really beg you to think what it is you want to say and say it. If you want to discuss with me or kind of Hugo or anyone, you know, maybe there are like you feel inhibited from doing so, we'll find some other way of you ask, asking your question. <clears throat> but let's not go through this fortnight in a sort of pretense fashion. You can get up, you know, there are no lawyers here you can make the most startling allegations against the place. Uh, you know, at one level, the more unworthy and ghastly your comments, you know, at least it will get the kind of thing going. But please, and I really do beg you, don't let's kind of conduct this fortnight uh, within a context of sort of just consumption. Because then it'll never, it'll never go right. And so I do, you know, try to place on you, you know, I can say this in front of Paul because he's a long-term friend of the school, but you must kind of gather your thoughts, maybe even before you come here. Uh, and please, please intervene. For the rest, I can't imagine a kind of more successful way of outlining a number of issues and questions uh, that we have to think about. Uh, although we're going to move up to the bar now, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank on your behalf Paul. Thank you.